Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Kostelnik with Rooted Behavioral Education. I'm committed to bringing you educational content to help further your vestibular recovery. And I'm really excited about the topic that we have today, which is mindfulness and meditation. And we'll talk about kind of how those things are similar and how those things are different. Um, and you probably have heard a little bit about mindfulness. It's a bit of a buzzword right now. There's kind of growing evidence for its place in promoting well-being. There's even some evidence um, that it can change your brain structurally. So we're going to dive in with Charles Freely today on that. And Charles has a PhD in clinical psychology, and he's worked with a variety of different populations therapeutically, but has really come to a place of specializing in presence and the impact that that has on well-being. He's currently doing virtual coaching one-on-one -on -one with individual clients. He's a content creator for a meditation app called Insight Timer. And he's also a podcast host for a podcast called What Is Now? He also writes a weekly blog and he's working on his first book. So I'd like to welcome Charles to our interview. Hello, thanks for having me. Sure. So let's get the topic started by talking about how do you define mindfulness? What does that mean? It's a really good question. And I think there are many different definitions. And like you said, it's become definitely a buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, it's also like maybe a little tricky from my lens because I'm in this world where I'm constantly talking about this stuff and like talking with other people that also talk about this stuff. So sometimes I can assume that mm -hmm. someone might already know something about it. Um, so I'll just try to like keep it really simple, which I think is like the spirit of it anyways, is like to keep it really simple. Uh, but the way I define what mindfulness is, I like to use symbols and like imagery and metaphor, because I think mm -hmm. a lot of what mindfulness is, it's actually hard to define and put into words because a lot of what it is has to do with experience and, mm -hmm. and like feeling and like presence is right here in front of us and we're in it right now. But as soon as we try to like talk about it or conceptualize it, we're sort of blocking our ability to really be in it. And that's kind of like what mindfulness is, is so, like short circuiting all the ways that we try to exert control over right now and helping us to just like really feel what is always here. Mm -hmm. And there's one simple, I guess you would call it an analogy for it um, that I think is helpful. And uh, so I like to say mindfulness is pressing play and that like we can get so caught up on pressing fast forward and pressing rewind mm -hmm. in so many different ways in life. But if you can think of life as like a song the only way to like really experience, like if you could imagine on your phone and you just get stuck pressing the fast forward button or the rewind button because you want to have some grasp over it or some certainty about where the song's going to go uh, or whatever it might be and you keep pressing fast forward or rewind, the thing is you can never actually like be doing what it is you were hoping to do in the first place, which is just to like enjoy and experience a song. But the only way that you can do that is by pressing play and like letting go and then just letting it happen and experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And so I, that to me is kind of like what mindfulness is and it can be applied to anything. Like it could be a conversation or um, a sunset or walking or eating a meal or even things that are like frustrating or sad or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the ability to press play on your present moment experience and then just experience it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It, it does totally. And I love, I love that symbol. I think it's so kind of easy to grasp and feels very concrete. Um, and I think totally captures kind of us trying to live in the future or in the past and have the, I guess, people wanting to have that control and being able to just take a step back and hit play captures it really well. I, I haven't heard that. So I really appreciated oh, that. Cool. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about how this can be applied to different situations. So you said like a sunset or a conversation or taking a walk. So if someone were to be interested in starting a mindfulness practice, where might they start? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think this feels to me like an inbuilt ability that we all have that might come 
really naturally like when we're children for example there's mm -hmm. the ability to press play or it's just like we automatically press play and then we we sort of develop this fast forward and rewind thing mm -hmm. um but i think it i mean in a very simple way in terms of integrating this like you might just apply that mindset or maybe even just pick like one experience that you have throughout your day like it might be when you eat your dinner or your breakfast or your lunch or when you have a conversation or like a common one is when you brush your teeth or when you shower or something like that to notice the ways that your mind is like moving away from what it is that you're experiencing and then remember what it is that you're doing right now and even like internally feeling like you're pressing play on that thing and then open back up to what this experience is actually like right now mm -hmm. and that to me that feels like like a mindfulness practice mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. just remembering and there are lots of apps i think that you can use that like if you just were to search mindfulness like there's mm -hmm. things that you know, courses i have my own courses like mm -hmm. in terms of something that's a bit more tangible or logistical um but that to me feels like something that anyone could do mm -hmm. or like or anytime you see a tree for example that could be a reminder to stop and see this thing as something new it's like even imagine yourself like pressing your finger on something in front of you you're pressing play on it and then you open back up to oh yeah like what is this mm -hmm. actually like in front of me right now mm -hmm. or a feeling um that can be a really helpful one too like i have a feeling that i interpret as quote unquote anxiety and then i'm fast forwarding to maybe get away from it or make it try to make it go away or stop talking so I can run away from it or I'm pressing rewind I'm remembering the times where it's happened before and I'm like being afraid that something like that's going to happen again but then there's also the possibility to press play on it and then it like loses its label and I can just open up to what the feeling is like right now in this moment which mm -hmm. might be like kind of a tight feeling or mm -hmm tension, heart racing, that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I can let go of that being good or bad, but it's just happening right now. Um, right, right. And for, if there's anyone who feels like that's maybe not concrete or you're kind of like, I don't like, I don't, that feels kind of abstract. You can think of it too, as kind of, again, pressing play and then focusing on your five senses of like, mm -hmm. what, what is this sensory input that I'm getting right now? Um, and you had mentioned your courses and we'll get to that at the end, if anyone is interested in pursuing that. So, and there was one other thing you mentioned that I thought was interesting. Oh, like how children are very in the moment reminds me very much of a therapy that I really like, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And kind of, as we become adults and older language becomes so prominent and we try to problem solve our internal experiences with language Again, that's, I know that sounds abstract, but usually that doesn't work so well, which is why it's a mindfulness-based therapy. So it's more kind of getting us into our bodies and into our experiences. Um, so let me segue into, so I mentioned in the beginning mindfulness and meditation and kind of are those the same, are those different? So I'm wondering if you can shed light on some similarities and some differences with those. Mm -hmm. I would say that they are like very similar, but maybe an easy way of understanding it still within the framework of the, the press and play and the fast forward and rewind scenario or framework uh, is that, so yeah, that sounds simple enough to be able to press play, but the fast forward and rewind might have become so strongly ingrained that it might even feel impossible to actually be able to do that for more than a second, because then the thinking mind like comes back in and it could even be like increasingly frustrating because you're trying to press play and you you feel like you can't or like I'm bad at this or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. So I see meditation as something that, and I think a whole variety of things like could serve this purpose too. And it's also tricky because like you, like you mentioned, language gets in the way and there might be so much connotation that comes along with a word like meditation or even mm -hmm. a mindfulness. Um, but that meditation can just be something where you can train yourself to have more access to a play button that you can like be able to press more throughout your day. Um, and so I think of like, quote unquote, meditation as like the pause button, uh, like, like building yourself an internal pause button 
that you maybe like specifically train consistently and then you're also pressing it again and again and it becomes more and more accessible throughout the day and you're able to intentionally press pause and then open up to whatever that thing is maybe in a new way um so that's kind of what it well, means to me like developing your access to mindfulness mm -hmm. like it's kind of like mindfulness is kind of being used in I guess you could say sort of like a stressful situation potentially. And so practicing meditation is kind of practicing before the big game, so to speak. So it's kind totally. of skill building to be able to use it in real life, you know, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, that's how it seems to me, which would seem to me to be an essential step in terms mm -hmm. of actually being able to utilize that, like in a situation where it might be especially difficult mm -hmm. to utilize that. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. That's that. So that's a good, the next thing I was asking or hoping to ask you, um, I think people can feel intimidated by this, you know, like you said, like maybe I'm bad at this, or maybe I've tried it and my, my mind starts racing. So if for people who feel intimidated or they've tried it before and they feel like they can't get into it, do you have any specific tips or recommendations? I would just say that that to me seems like inevitable and maybe that's just the reframe that it makes it okay versus that meaning that there's something wrong with you or that you're bad at it or there's something you're doing incorrectly or that it's just not for you mm -hmm. um, that to me seems like it's just an inherent part of what meditation is like feeling the frustration of looking at your mind and noticing that it's all over the place and i can say that I've been consistently meditating for like over 10 years, I would say at this point, like on a daily basis. And I continually, my mind is still wandering all the time. And it's still like when I wake up in the morning, it's like it goes. And I think that's maybe just what the mind does. And, and I continue to notice that in, in meditation. But I think the thing that's really changed is my relationship with those thoughts is much more one of like friendship or harmony. It's like, okay, th there's that. And then there's also all this other stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. it maybe just kind of evens the playing field where the thinking mind isn't the thing that's totally dominant, even though it might still be there. Um, so that's one thing. I get another visual that can be helpful, I think, is um, maybe you've heard this before, is the idea of a microscope and that in doing something like meditation or mindfulness or any sort of self-awareness practice. It's like you are refining your microscope of like awareness. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking something that maybe had like five times magnification and you're making it 10 times magnification or like a hundred times magnification. And so you're seeing a lot more and it's not that there's like more stuff there. It's just that you're seeing more of what was already there all the time and which can like be another little reframe for for noticing all of this stuff coming mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. i think maybe it's also a reframe for doing more and more meditation practice you might become more and more aware of stuff that's there which can also feel like there's something wrong with me or i'm doing this wrong mm -hmm. but maybe it's just that you're continually noticing stuff on a more and more uh like subtle level mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. I think so that's, that's interesting. I think. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard the microscope analogy, um, but that's interesting. I like that. And going back to what you said about kind of the judgment that we have, like, I'm, I'm bad at this. I think that in and of itself is a really good opportunity to use mindfulness in the sense of just having no judgment mm -hmm. or saying like, wow, I'm having the thought that I'm bad at this. Okay. You know, I'm going to sit with that. Right. Putting that on the same playing field as everything else that you notice, because there's a way in which that can feel almost like it's something separate from what you're becoming aware of. Like I'm trying, I'm supposed to become aware of the breath or uh, thoughts or mm -hmm. sensations. And, and then there's this other thing, like you're bad at this, like this sucks or this mm -hmm. is boring. And, but like you're saying, that's also something just to become aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that can be a really helpful thing that like noticing I'm feeling like I'm bad at this or I'm feeling like what's the point of this mm -hmm. uh, like that those are also 
maybe more subtle things to continually just become aware of and then you can return back to just like openness mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so I mentioned people who might feel intimidated by it for anyone who's listening, who feels like they have a regular meditation practice. They, you try to use mindfulness on a daily basis. Um, I know you have a lot of experience personally with using mindfulness meditation or presence, um, and professionally. So I'm wondering if you have any tips or tricks or advice for how to deepen that practice. Um, I guess a few things, it might just be one thing I think of is just trying like different types. Um, Maybe if you've mostly done guided meditation practices, you could try more silent meditation practices. Mm -hmm. I I know I'm currently at a point, um, well, I guess that might make it sound like there's some sort of progression or something, but currently where I stand in meditation is it's all silent Um, and I'm not doing anything, just like sitting there. And that's the most kind of interesting version of it uh, for me versus there are other times where my whole focus has been on counting to 10 on each exhale. And I just like stay with that. And then I notice when I move away from that and I come back to it. Um, So I guess one way might be experimenting with a different type that maybe you haven't tried before. Um, Another one could be going for a lot longer than you've tried up to this point. Um, doing, I mean, it depends on what the person has already done, but maybe doing meditations that are like an hour long uh, or even longer potentially. Uh, I've noticed that that can open, at, at least it has opened me to stuff that I just would not have been aware of if not for staying with it for that period of time. Um, there's another visual. I'm full of like thousands of visuals because it's like all I think about. Uh, but there's another one that's like, if you could think of your mind as like a, a glass full of water and it's got like a bunch of sediment or sand or, or mud and stuff in it. And what needs to happen is you need to hold it kind of still long enough for all of that to gradually drop down to the bottom of the glass and then it becomes clear. Uh, And so that I think of like the time that you're in meditation, sometimes it might just take a really long time for that stuff to settle all the way down to the bottom of the glass. And there might be ways in which like we keep shaking it up in within the meditation, like or like which could be the fast forward or rewind, or it could be a variety of other things. Um, But it's like we might not have been sitting long enough. And if you had only like sat for another 15 minutes or something, like you might've seen something else that you had never seen before. Um, So maybe experimenting with something like that. And I guess another thing I think of is if you have the potential to go on some sort of retreat or some extended period of time where that's all you're doing, um, or you have a period of time where you're in silence, um, that's something that I've been doing on a yearly basis for a while now, uh, where I go to this Zen Buddhist monastery Um, and I stay there for like a week or two at a time. I'm not, I don't identify as Buddhist, but that just happened to be the one that I didn't have to pay for initially. Uh, cause like all the other ones that I found were pretty expensive. Um, and that one, I just had to work as like part of the community that was there, which was, I thought was really just cool anyways. Uh, but I think by doing that, I was also able to see something that I just wouldn't have been able to see if not for being in a place where that's all I'm focused on for an extended period of time, um, which can be really challenging to. Yeah, for sure. Those are a couple of things. Yeah, no, that's definitely helpful. Um, So it sounds like presence has become a really big part of your life. Um, And I know it's really shaped the work that you do with your clients. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how it's, been meaningful or impactful for you personally and also what you've seen with working with clients and having that be sort of the main focus to me it just helps you to be able to so there's a definition of psychological health that I like from going back to Fritz Perls uh, from like the Stalt mm-hmm. psychology world um, I don't know how, what people think about him, uh, but the definition is something like 
psychological health is the ability to experience what is new as new. Um, mm. And I really like that. And I think that speaks to a lot of my understanding and, and the philosophy behind whatever it is that I do, that, that what is happening right now is, it seems to me, constantly actually fully new. It's like brand new constantly but it can be so hard to actually see it and experience that way because of what we've experienced and because of our conditioning and the ways that we've learned to interact with the world and adapt to the world. And it makes a lot of sense too, because so much of that stuff has like helped us in different ways or helped us to adapt to maybe things that have been challenging. But a lot of those ways also make it so difficult to actually like see this unfolding experience that's right in front of us at all times like as actually new and if if we can do that then it's just like opens up so much possibility in your daily life um and like opens up going back to the the child opens up like the childlike ability to play with a box or something like they got a you know they got a toy and they don't care about that they're just like the box is so interesting and i think anything can actually be that way, but it takes sort of unraveling so much of the stuff that's on top of how we see things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what presence means to me, like the ability to be able to see the newness in anything. And I think a lot of that comes back to language, like you, me like you mentioned, mm -hmm. how everything has a label and like, and even I and you have these labels and, or this clock here, there's a label for it. Like, and, but those are all tools that we use to communicate and describe things, but those are also just words. And then our, our world can be just made up of words. And it's this very limited way of actually experiencing like the newness of this clock uh, or of a tree or of myself or my wife or uh, anything. Um, so if, if that makes sense, that's like it, it totally what does. presence means to me. And then I mm -hmm. think you, anything that you do in the effort of developing presence um, can be helpful. And that could be like meditation and mindfulness, or I think there can be so many different names for what that stuff might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's a, I, I like that. It, it's almost like life has a like more vibrancy or more vibrance. I'm trying to think of other I feel like there's not necessarily even a word that comes to mind. Maybe that's good, right. um, but it's like, there's uh, that something sounds right. like it's more vivid, something like it's special, more yeah. alive, They're more alive, more, more special. Um, so I'm wondering if you can walk us through just a brief meditation. Maybe there's maybe people that haven't done any, this type of thing before. So maybe something mm -hmm. kind of simple just to kind of maybe dip their toes into it and I'll go ahead and sure. We can do one that I kind of like that you can do anywhere and you, uh, you also can do it in a way where like if you don't want people looking at you or thinking that you're weird, like you can engage with it, um, but you can also engage with it like with your eyes closed or your eyes open. Um, and I, I like it because it engages uh, like a couple different senses. Um, so it mostly engages your the breath and also the sense of touch. And it has to do with your hand. And so I think this can be used in a like variety of different ways. It can, it can be used as something that can help you, like if you're feeling overwhelmed, it could be sort of a grounding tool, mm -hmm. um, but it can also just be an interesting way of experiencing what's happening right now, or maybe to experience your hand in a new way or the breath in a new way. Okay. Um, and so I'll just share, you, share with you what it is and then we'll just go through it one time. Um, but I call it, finger tracing. So you may have heard of this before, or finger breathing is what I call it. Okay. Um, but so basically what we're going to do is you're going to feel into the breath and in your mind or in your body, along with the sensations of the breath, you're going to trace internally the sensations of your hand, starting with the bottom of your thumb. And when you breathe in, your first inhale is going to trace the sensation in, just in your mind up to the top of the thumb. And then the exhale is going to trace down to the little place in between your thumb and your pointer finger, your index finger. And then you're going to inhale and feel up the index finger and exhale, feel down the index finger, and then up 
and down and up and down until you get to the end of the pinky at the other side of the hand. And so don't worry about like doing it right or if like, I don't, don't know if I feel it totally, just see however you can internally feel the sensations in your hand. And if you wanted to, you could look at your hand or you could do it without looking at your hand. I might just do it looking at my hand. Um, and so does that make sense? Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I guess for this, I would say to uh, maybe just become aware of what the breathing is like. So and I'm going to close not... my eyes. If yeah, that's okay. Sounds good. okay. <laughs> and, and to not try to make your breath be any particular way, but just become aware of what the breath feels like. And when we do the tracing, just do it however the breath is happening. So if it's happening like fast, that's okay. If it's happening slowly, that's okay. Or if it changes, just trace along with whatever the natural rhythm of the breath is. Okay, and so we'll start at the bottom of the, the outside bottom of the thumb. And then on the next inhale, you can feel the breath coming up to the top of the thumb. And then on the next exhale, you can feel the sensation tracing back down to the bottom of the thumb. And then see if you can do that moving across each finger to the end of the hand. Okay, so I just got to the end of my hand. Um, Guess hopefully my that was straightforward was, enough. What was no, it was. Like I just think my breath was faster today. <laughs> yeah. what, what was what was that like? It was really interesting. I actually had my hands kind of like this, so huh. I did them both of them, mm -hmm. and it was definitely a new. I, I hadn't done that before, so it was a new huh. experience for me. Um, and it's I would say my hands are not usually a focus of a meditation practice. So it was definitely, mm -hmm. it, it felt new and huh. engaging. I liked it. Yeah, I like the idea of doing them together. I'm just putting my hands together now and I notice how much more kind of sensation that I feel mm -hmm. when they're together. Mm -hmm. um, so I might try to do that more myself. I, I've noticed that my hands have become one of my major kind of mindfulness anchors like that's another thing maybe to think of is like identifying anchors for yourself to return mm -hmm. to that are sort of founded in the body somewhere like it could be your feet or my hands in particular have become the main ones for me and now whenever I become aware of my hands there's like so much energy there um it's just kind of really interesting to become mm -hmm. aware of yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for for walking us through that. Um, so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit of like online resources and we'll get to, to specifically what you do, but are, are there specific apps that you like or specific websites or anything mm -hmm. that comes to mind in terms of resources? Yeah, so, I mean, well, I guess the first one is the one that I'm on, <laughs> which is Insight Timer, which I think is, is pretty great. Um, there are different versions of that. There's a free version, which has a bunch of free guided meditations. And you also have access to these live sessions that they're doing now, which is a pretty cool feature. Mm -hmm. um, there's like, anytime you go on there, there's gonna be somebody doing some live session on something that you can actually engage directly with the teacher in the moment. Um, so that's pretty cool. But then also there's a paid version of it where you get access to a whole bunch of different courses on a wide variety of topics and they continue to add new courses on there. So likely if you have a particular interest, there might be a course related to it on there. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, I also really like the Waking Up app by Sam Harris. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Sam Harris at all, mm -mm. but he, he's more in the like philosophy world, but he also okay. has this background in meditation and mindfulness. And he's developed an app called Waking Up. Uh, and I think he just does a really nice job of speaking very straightforward language about what this stuff is uh, okay. and the app begins with a 50-day series it's just supposed to kind of like 
give you a basic intro to what all of this stuff is in very understandable, digestible language and expose you to a variety of different types of practices. Um, so that's actually been like my personal, that's the one that I would use if I do guided meditations. There's also a bunch of courses on there and stuff too, but that's just the one that seems to speak to me the most. Okay. Um, so that might be just something too, because there are so many different apps now to maybe mm -hmm. find the one that speaks your language, because it seems to me that they're all talking about the same stuff, but it um, might just, the thing that might make it click is finding like the teacher or the app mm -hmm. or the one that is just kind of speaks to you. Um, so you can internalize it in your own way. Mm -hmm. uh, so those things, um, um, there's one, there's one yeah, website sorry. called, called brainpickings.org that I, I just thought of today, which doesn't, you might not necessarily relate it to mindfulness or meditation, but they just, they constantly provide new articles and book recommendations that are, to me, they're very related to this topic, but it's less overtly or explicitly so, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really cool. Uh, so that's another one, brainpickings.org. Okay. Um, and then a few questions from readers. One person asked about resources for professionals. So I think she meant specifically like if a healthcare provider was interested in learning more and maybe something that they might be able to use in their own practice. Um, is there anything that comes to mind for that? I. You mentioned a book maybe? Yeah, there's, there's one book that I think of that's called Sitting Together. Um, that could be useful. It's, it's, it's it basically is addressing utilization of mindfulness in therapy work. Okay. Um, there is another one that's like mindfulness based cognitive therapy and um, very kind of textbooky feel mm -hmm. to that one. Mm -hmm. um, going back to different languages, there's actually one that I'm reading right now that's called Zen therapy. Uh, and so if anyone's interested in more of the language of Buddhist psychology and, and the terms that they use, which is actually a language that speaks to me um, pretty well in terms of breaking down our sense perceptions and the way that we become conditioned in the world. Uh, there's this book as well. It's called Zen Therapy and the author is David Brazier. Uh, okay. So those are just cool. a few that I think of. Um, and I, I, I was just doing some research because I was curious also, and it looks like there's some medical schools that are kind of catching onto this as well. So some other resources I found were University of Pennsylvania Medical School, UCLA, UCSD, all have um, centers for mindfulness. So if you wanted to Google that, they have various resources and different trainings. Um, next reader question was how long to meditate? Like, is there a too short, a too long? Like, how do you know where to start? It's a good question too. And maybe that goes back to what I was talking about before, like in terms of the, the cup of water and the, and the stuff inside the water. It's like sometimes it, you might need to sit for a little bit longer. I would say maybe the main thing is that if it feels like a barrier to even do it at all, to sit for... 10 minutes or something, if, if, if whatever it is, if it feels like too long to even just sit for, to just do it for a minute. And that's, that's good. And I think a minute can be incredibly impactful. If you just take a minute to try to become aware of what's happening, it's going to affect the momentum of the rest of your day based on that one minute of time. Mm -hmm. um, even if you might not be necessarily meditating in the way that you want to, or doing it up to a particular standard. Uh, so that's on one side of it if doing it for a certain period of time is a barrier to doing it at all, even doing it for a, what might seem like a really short time can be really impactful, I think. Um, but then on the, on the other side, I think if you're feeling like frustrated or like you're not getting something out of it, it might be worthwhile to sit for a longer period of time and to really sit through discomfort or boredom or like frustration with it. And that maybe is even a, a good sign that like there's something there to stay with uh, for longer. Um, so it doesn't really answer the question. I can just say like no. for, for, my, for myself, I uh, meditate for about 20 minutes every day. I have a timer for 20 minutes and then I'll often sit for a little bit longer than that. And then just like move into my morning routine. For me, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's really helpful to do it in the morning uh, because I guess I see it as like, if you're a ship at sea, like, and the you're about to set off to sea for the rest of your day, that it seems essential to me to spend some time like calibrating the direction of your ship before you go out, because otherwise it's going to be really easy to go off course. Um, but if you've already like centered yourself before the day has started, it would be a lot easier to keep coming back, just like little course corrections back to that main underlying direction. Um, but if not for that, then you might already like just start your day off in a certain direction and just kind of give up on that day. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it, if, if, even if it's not meditation, it might just be some like period of, I call it calibration, um, some period of time spent just like centering yourself and kind of returning to how you really want to be living, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of what meditation means to me. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that yeah. kind of answers your it question. It does. It does. I, I mean, I think, I don't know if the person who, who asked this was getting at like, how much do you need? Like, what does research show in terms of amount? And I think right. there's really no consensus on that. Um, so I've heard your... something like like ten minutes mm -hmm. or something I, like that. I, I I saw something that said ten to twenty minutes three times a week, and then they they noticed like when they did um, brain scans, it was like after eight weeks they noticed structural changes. But I think to your point, taking that non non judgmental stance of you know, whatever works for me today, you mm -hmm. know, I'm just going to set aside some time, um, and try not to have, if it feels like a barrier, then I'll do less and maybe I'll build that up. Maybe I won't, you know, just mm -hmm. whatever it's, it's individual. Um, and then the last question was what if meditation makes me feel more anxious? And to me, it would also it seems inevitable to me in the deepest sense that it will. Uh, and that is also maybe the benefit of a meditation or a mindfulness practice. It helps you to approach things that feel uncomfortable and it helps you to create a new relationship with those things. Um, maybe there's like a dynamic between, or this is a pretty commonly, I guess, thought of or talked about dynamic of controlling what you can control and changing what you can change and accepting the rest. But I think it can be actually maybe really difficult sometimes to accept the other stuff that is out of your control. Um, and meditation to me is like a tool for actually genuinely developing the ability to do that by just like kind of sitting through uncomfortable feelings um, mm -hmm. and developing this sort of new way of seeing things as new, like for me, the anxiety feeling. I, I I used to have quite a bit of anxiety, particularly social anxiety. And I actually think that those sensations are still very much so the same in me now, but I have a very changed relationship with them where it's like, it's totally okay for me to feel a particular sensation. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with me or anything wrong with the current situation. Um, and somehow through that stance of openness to those sensations, it's like, they don't care anymore or they like stay, they don't get any louder um but it's a really subtle thing because mm -hmm. i think if i'm there might be a way in which i like i'm accepting them but i'm really accepting them with the underlying intention to get rid of them mm -hmm. and it's like you know it's a part of you so it knows that you're you're not actually actually really <laughs> genuinely like accepting those feelings right. um so i think like a meditation practice is something that helps you be able to actually do that. And then I guess it's up to you to decide like, well, is this something that I wanna look into further? I think maybe that's also something that can come up with meditation. Like it brings you to the crossroads of, do I wanna keep trying other strategies to get rid of this thing? Or do I want to like go into it more directly? Mm -hmm. And then that's also up to, I think the person to decide what it is that they wanna do. Cause meditation is gonna be the road that will probably take you directly like, into it and likely it will become intensified. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. I remember hearing something about like some research study, I can't remember it now, but there's some sort of curve where it does get worse first, but that's like the thing that's necessary for it to like to drop way down mm -hmm. after that. But that's also the thing, like the scary thing that would keep someone from going mm -hmm. further into it. 
There's also a study, I think, about um, it was like some long term meditation practitioners and then a group of people who hadn't practiced meditation and they were in some research paradigm with pain. I don't know how recent this was or if they would still be able to do this today. Um, but there was like they administered some sort of shock. Uh, and the thing was, like the research participants knew that there was going to be some shock administered to them, uh, but they didn't know when it was going to happen. And so what they and then they, I guess they measured some sort of stress response in the participants. And what they found was that the the ones that hadn't meditated or like hadn't had the experience of meditation, their stress response was like up the whole time. Um, it only went up for a, it. <laughs> right. It only went up a little bit when it happened. Uh, but then, and then after that, it was still up because like they didn't know if it was going to be coming again. Right. But then the interesting thing was with the experienced meditators, like their stress response was super low the whole time. But then when it happened, it was a lot higher than the other group during that period of time. So it was almost like they felt it more intensely mm -hmm. uh, in that moment. But then, and then right after it, it goes way back down to to nothing. Um, so well, maybe really a way of thinking about. That no, it is. It, it, it is. I think it's a really good analogy to how we live now, like the constant stress, like people's cortisol, for example, mm -hmm. is so high all the time because um, we're constantly bombarded by different things. And again, usually hitting fast forward. Right. Um, but yeah, I like the the winding that that reminds me of like trauma therapy for example, not to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but anyway, this has been super interesting and helpful. I'm so appreciative for your time. I'm wondering if you can tell us if someone were interested in working with you or learning more from you. I know you mentioned a little bit in the beginning. Um, remind us where we can find you. Yeah, just uh, all my stuff is at my website, charlesfreely.com. Uh, I'll link that. Charles I'll link. And, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll link that. <laughs> my, my last name's kind of complicated, uh, but you can find everything there. And yeah, if someone wanted to work with me, they could reach out to me there. Um, but also have a blog there and a podcast there and uh, a couple other things. So all my stuff is there. All right, charlesfreely.com. Um, and if you wanted to learn more from me, you can find me at rootedbehavioraleducation.com. And until next time, see you later. Thanks.